<clears throat> the next talk is going to be a, a dog and, a, and pony show. Um, Who's what? <laughs> <laughs> so Rob and I decided that we would uh, divide up just uh, telling people a little bit about what is known about uh, chemistry and hydrocarbons, specifically uh, the solubility of organic compounds in, uh, in hydrocarbon solutions in relation to uh, Titan. Uh, and then I'm going to say a few words uh, about supercritical uh, carbon uh, dioxide, which I knew nothing about uh, two months ago. Uh, <laughs> but we'll show you some movies and some interesting things to bring everybody uh, up to speed with the properties and applications of that uh, solvent. So we'll take 20 minutes each and all the questions afterwards. So Rob Hodes there, he's in the, <coughs> in the uh, planetary uh, sciences, planetary ISIS uh, groups at, uh, at JPL. Uh, got his uh, PhD at uh, Caltech and uh, terrific, uh, yeah. <laughs> terrific student there, uh, and uh, currently at uh, JPL. Thanks, Jack. So, like Jack said, I'm going to talk about uh, hydrocarbon chemistry. Um, and before I start with that, let me just say that uh, I want to thank uh, Mike Malaska, who's right there. Both uh, he did a lot of the solubility experiments that I'm going to talk about, um, as well as I stole a bunch of slides from him as well as Tuan, Tuan Vu and Morgan Cable, uh, who did a lot of, the, uh, of some of the other work that I'm gonna talk about. So, so first what we're gonna talk about, you know, this is chemistry 101, what are we talking about? Hydrocarbons, right? So these are the first five uh, linear alkanes. Uh, they're all, we're all probably familiar with these, methane, ethane, propane, butane. I'm just going to make a few quick points about these. One of these is that as they get bigger, naturally, you can get um, isomers, various structural isomers of these. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, there will just be more and more and more of these. Um, and so when we talk about these, you know, the system can get very complex very quickly. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that if we just look at uh, some of the properties of these, um, the in this case we're looking at melting point, the properties change a lot depending on, these on what the structure is. And so this is something that we always need to keep in mind when dealing with this kind of system because in a natural environment that produces, you know, so as we see on Titan, something like ethane from ethane, you also get propane and you'll get a little butane and the system can get complex even with just these hydrocarbons very quickly. So, the other thing I want to point out is the liquid ranges. So these are the, the liquid ranges at uh, atmospheric pressure for the first 10 uh, linear alkanes um, compared to water. Here's water, 0 to 100 C. Uh, here's methane, ethane, propane. You see that the, these ranges are pretty, pretty wide, wider than water in a lot of cases. Um, they're also liquid at very low temperatures. Um, and like Christoph pointed out, um, if we're going to talk about hydrocarbons as solvents for these things, we probably want to talk about the ones that are going to be in abundance. And these big long ones are probably not going to be in abundance in planetary environments. It's going to be the methanes, the ethane, maybe some propane. So if we're dealing in these fluids, we're going to be dealing at low temperatures, at cryogenic temperatures. And that's trouble. Uh, low temperatures make life more difficult. And this is a picture illustrating how it makes life difficult for uh, interns working in the lab. We do all of our work in these glove bags to exclude uh, atmospheric moisture and oxygen, and we work under liquid nitrogen. And anyone, uh, or we work with liquid nitrogen, and the bag is purged with nitrogen. That makes it like Titan. Anyone who's ever tried to do anything delicate in a glove bag knows that this turns things into a real pain, just having to do this. So it, low temperatures make life difficult for students. Yes, she is. And Mike and I had a discussion about this. Um, I, I maintain that the bulkiness of a cryo glove would actually make it more dangerous to use a cryo glove in this circumstance. And I'm going to stick with that. OK. So low temperatures reduce solubility. Um, the solubilities that I'm going to show you are all pretty low uh, for, mo for a lot of things. So that's one impediment to you know, getting life in these fluids. The other thing is that low temperatures reduce reaction rates. Um, we all you know, sort of know this instinctively. It's why you cook food. Um, I'm not really going to talk about reaction rates. I am going to talk a lot about solubility. And I'm going to 
show you some of the experiments that we've done at JPL to measure experimentally uh, solubility in some of these fluids. So you saw what was in the glove bag. This is what's in the glove bag. This is something uh, Mike and I built up, uh, have built up over the past few years. Um, there's a, a heavily instrumented beaker uh, sitting inside a liquid nitrogen bath, and we simply heat it up to 94 Kelvin, keep it under a nitrogen atmosphere. It's basically just a temperature-controlled little beaker uh, full of fluid that we can work with. Um, the way we do an experiment, this sort of illustrates what's happening in the beaker. The, the beaker is filled with liquid ethane. There's a camera so we can observe what's going on. There's a fiber optic probe, it looks like that, that sits uh, in a fitted, fritted filter tube. Uh, in an experiment, you would condense your hydrocarbon of interest in here, dump in whatever sol you, you want to measure the solubility of. There's a stir bar, stir it around and periodically suck fluid up past the, the uh, fiber optic probe. Uh, the filter removes any particles that might be in there, and you'll take uh, a UV absorption spectrum of the solution. This is great for things that absorb well in the UV. Um, so that's uh, the, one of the first things we started with was benzene. This is what the uh, ultraviolet absorption spectrum of benzene looks like in ethane at 94 Kelvin. Uh, that's the black line. We use, uh, you see there's a very strong absorption uh, down here, close to 200, and then this uh, vibrationally split band here. We use this to do uh, our quantitation of the amount of benzene that's in there, and you get curves that look like this. So you have zero at the beginning, and over time, the saturation of the benzene comes up. Oh, that didn't work out well, did it? Comes up and flattens out. So that's saturation. Uh, there's you know, one thing that is sort of surprising just from looking at this is that you reach saturation in under two hours, maybe an hour. That's pretty fast, really, for something that you might expect to go a lot slower at this temperature. Um, what's maybe not so surprising are you know, the numbers you get. Uh, we've done these three molecules, benzene, naphthalene, biphenyl. Benzene gets you a saturation uh, con concentration of about 18 milligrams per liter. That's not much. Um, a liter is a relatively large quantity. 18 milligrams is not. Naphthalene and biphenyl are even less. Um, it's an important amount, but it's not a lot. It's still pretty small. Um, so this is a, uh, a table that combines a bunch of data from uh, these uh, numbers at the top are from uh, Roland. Uh, these are, uh, and you can see, you know, they're, they're, these are theoretical numbers for solubility in a methane nitrogen liquid and in an ethane nitrogen liquid. The methane nitrogen is, um, you know, 23% nitrogen, the ethane nitrogen is 3%. Um, you can see their benzene number for ethane is pretty close to ours. So they got 16 theoretically, we get 18. That's pretty good. Um, you see, that's a, so, you know, I sort of cherry picked these to show a range of stuff. There are some things that are very soluble: uh, hydrogen cyanide, you know, acetylene, uh, butane. Things sort of trail off as they get bigger and more polar, but that's exactly what you'd expect. Um, sort of the lesson of this is: these small things, small things can be very soluble, but as they get bigger and bigger, there's just going to be very little that you can dissolve in these. These molecules are interesting. These polyethers were something that Steve Benner worked on. Um, he was considering these as uh, sort of genetic type polymers that could be possibly used for, for information in a, uh, in, a, in a life form that might live in this. But even in propane at 190 Kelvin, you still get uh, less than milligram and a half per milliliter. And that's at a much higher temperature than you know, anything that we would see on Titan. And so it's very difficult to get big things that you might need for life to dissolve in these fluids. One thing that you can get to dissolve is gases. Um, so here are numbers that we've measured in my lab for argon in methane and ethane and, argon and krypton in methane and ethane. And you see argon in methane at 94 Kelvin is, and this is in mole fraction now, not in milligrams per liters, mole fraction. That's, uh, that's almost half. Um, so you can dissolve an enormous amount of argon in methane if you want to, but 
the same time, who cares about argon? You know, it's not particularly useful for life in any way. So we don't really care about that. But what I, want to sh I do want to show you, uh, Jonathan mentioned that nitrogen is pretty soluble in these fluids as well. And I want to show you if I can figure out how to do this, this movie. Whoops, that's the wrong button. Uh, yeah. So this shows um, what you're seeing here is the bottom of that beaker. Um, and there's liquid ethane up here. And this is solid ethane. This mush down here is solid ethane. And what you see as it freezes is these bubbles coming out. And that's nitrogen being excluded from the ethane as you make the ethane crystal structure. Um, and you know, the, the point I want to make with this and the idea you know, the, with the argon and the high solubility of the gases is that when we think about these fluids, we always need to be thinking that they're going to be very strongly multi-component mixtures. It's not just going to be hydrocarbon. It's going to be maybe two, two or three different hydrocarbons together, maybe you know, with varying amounts of dissolved nitrogen or possibly some other gases, and that you know, changes in phase and temperature can really change the uh, what, you know, what the liquid is made of, the composition of the liquid. And so we need to be aware of that as we, do all, as we think about what can happen in these liquids. So that's basically the point, first point I wanted to make. Low temperatures, reduced solubility. It's going to be very hard to get anything large and or polar to dissolve in these liquids. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about the reaction rates right now, but I think that will be something that we'll probably talk about a lot uh, throughout the rest of the workshop. However, I did want to point out that while this thing's, that low temperatures make life difficult, they also enable some things that we wouldn't get otherwise. And so, you know, these are just some interaction energies for certain, a lot of types of interactions that happen in biological molecules. These are typical values for hydrogen bond interactions. And these are the kinds of, val of interactions that are important to our biology, things that help proteins fold and hold DNA together. These are the energies for a lot of sort of different types of uh, aromatic at interactions. What are uh, especially, we'll look especially at this one, so what are called CH pi interactions, where the CH group sticks into the aromatic uh, pi system of something like benzene. These are much lower. These are low enough that you know, they usually don't come up strongly in a lot of uh, things at our temperatures and in our biology, but they're at you know, at the low temperatures where you'd find cryogenic hydrocarbon fluids, these might become important. And I'm going to show you an example of that. So these two pictures are from an experiment that we did in our lab. This is, uh, you know, there's a scale bar, 100 microns. This is crystalline solid benzene at 94 Kelvin. You dump ethane on it. You just pour ethane over it. You have to warm it up to maybe 120. Kelvin or so, and it turns into this. It's recrystallized. Um, something has happened to cause an interaction between the benzene and the ethane. Uh, we were able to get uh, synchrotron powder diffraction of these crystals. And you can see this is this, a sample that shows the diffraction pattern for pure benzene. And this is what happens after you go through that process, after you recrystallize it with ethane. And what you see is you get a very different pattern. You're making a, a very different structure here. We were able to solve that structure. And this is what you get. This is, you can see the benzenes are here. This is looking down one axis of the crystal. This is a single unit cell here. Benzenes are here, ethanes in the middle. We'll just, I'm just going to zoom in on one of these unit cells here. So you can see, uh, in, Again, there's the, here's the benzene molecules surrounding a single ethane. It's 3 to 1, benzene and ethane. Uh, the density is around 1. You know, a lot of things are. So that's not particularly strange. So there are six benzenes surrounding each ethane in sort of a ring. Um, and the structure itself is essentially held together by, these, by strings of benzenes in these CH pi bonds. Uh, the, that go throughout, you know, as, as you look at this structure, you can see these, these strings of CH pi bonded benzenes are, exist throughout it. The ethane is just held in with van der Waals forces, even an even lower 
uh, energy interaction. This crystal falls apart when you bring it up to about 150, 160 Kelvin. This kind of structure is only possible out of um, low temperatures uh, like you would find on Titan. Uh, so, you know, we can, we can sort of begin to speculate more wildly. This is something, uh, this is a, an image from a paper that uh, Lucy Norman wrote that shows what's called a reverse vesicle. Um, you have these hydrophobic uh, hydrocarbon tails and a hydrophilic head group. And you see the hydrophobic tails will stick out into the hydrocarbon fluid. The head groups, because they're hydrophilic, will want to stick to each other. And you'll make something that's sort of like a cell. And Lucy Norman postulated that this is the kind of thing that might exist um, in a Titan kind of lake. Uh, this is interesting. It, this would be very difficult, I think, to dissolve something that big um, into uh, a fluid at this temperature. But at the same time, maybe we can think about propane-dominated uh, or warmer kinds of environments where ethane and, and possibly and where ethane and propane are still liquid, but you could get a lot more solubility. This kind of uh, system has been shown to exist in, uh, in hexane, in nonpolar solvent. These are TEM micrographs that show uh, this C4 lecithin molecule forming these reverse vesicles uh, in, in, in hexane solvent. So I'm going to switch slightly and, and talk a little bit about what some of the sort of geological and sort of venues on hydrocarbon worlds that might, uh, where you might get chemistry that's, that's interesting. This is a, a cartoon that shows the organic cycle that you might have on uh, Titan, where you have uh, methane rain falling onto a, an organic surface. You'll get dissolution in rivers, lakes with things dissolved in them. And if the lakes dry up, you'll end up with evaporite basins. So we can use our solubility numbers to sort of understand more about what sorts of things might happen. Um, you can, if you, we take Ontario Lacus, a, a lake mainly composed of ethane in the southern hemisphere of Titan. You can uh, estimate a depth, say 10, 10 meters. We, get a, we have a surface area, so we have a volume. From uh, photochemical models, you can estimate a, uh, a benzene atmospheric flux rate. You get about 1 times 10 to the 6 molecules per centimeter squared per second falling onto the surface. From our solubility numbers, you can determine that you reach saturation in a, in a volume of liquid ethane that size in only 4.5 million years. And so that tells you that if these lakes last that long, which it seems like they might, that they should be saturated in benzene. And so you'll get a sludge of benzene at the bottom. Um, they'll be saturated in all sorts of other stuff, too, almost certainly. Um, but, and as well, not only will there be a sludge at the bottom, but when the lakes dry out, the things that are dissolved in them will also crash out. And so you'll, you get, uh, there's evidence from VIMS that shows spectral differences around the edges of the lakes that are interpreted uh, by some as mud flats or organic evaporite deposits. So these are the kinds of places where you can concentrate organics, even though the solubilities may be low, where you can get various, uh, uh, you'll get different layering as various uh, solutes crash out and precipitate out at different times. So you'll get sorting and separation of the, chemi of the chemistry. Um, and as well, it's interesting that, you, uh, that Nick talked about uh, these, these drying and uh, condensation cycles. This is you know, a similar environment, uh, using very different kinds of fluid and very different chemicals. But a similar sort of chemistry could conceivably be happening there. So I'll just conclude with a few points. Solubilities and reaction rates are low in these cold solvents, but uh, especially for things that we might think are interesting, big polar molecules that might have astrobiological significance. But you get other kinds of interactions um, that are interesting and wouldn't occur at temperatures that are higher. And as well, we, we know from looking at Titan that there's lots of dynamic processes that move chemicals around and sort them and bring them back together. And I think sort of the, the overall message is that a lot of this chemistry hasn't been explored really well, and just from you know, 
a, a small sort of step into it, you see all sorts of interesting things that you wouldn't have thought could have happened. And so I think there's a lot more work that we can do uh, to understand the kinds of chemistries that go on uh, in these kinds of fluids and on these kinds of worlds. With that. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jack Beecham, uh, professor of chemistry here at Caltech and one of the study co-leads. Um, Jack was my PhD advisor, and as he mentioned before, uh, yes, I did learn frugality in his lab, but I always thought that was one of the greatest lessons that you can learn as a grad student is how to build things cheaply and it, how to use the constraints of of what you had around you to be creative and to make new experiments and to do your work. So thank you, Jack. All right, thank you, Rob. And that you can have one of my drink tickets tonight, too. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to talk about uh, the second part of this uh, title called uh, Escape from uh, Water World. The idea, of course, uh, came from Kevin Costner's uh, movie. How many people have seen that, uh, that movie? At the time it was made, it was one of the most expensive movies that had ever been made, and it bombed. And that, but repeatedly, it's it just recently actually got rated as one of the ten, uh, one of the six best uh, disaster movies of, of all time, and of course it 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 it's in there ahead of uh, global uh, warming, uh, and uh, predicting that we could have our planet uh, covered in in water uh, someday. It takes evolution a little too far because. Uh, uh, after wandering around on his sailboat for a while, he's starting to develop gilts behind his ears. <laughs> yeah. As were the viewers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> phase diagrams. Um, students in physical chemistry hate these things, and I hate trying to explain them <laughs> in there, but we have to live with them, especially uh, with uh, respect to some of the topics that we've uh, considered uh, today, and we'll uh, continue to to uh, to consider. So this is actually a a, a, a PT diagram of uh, of carbon uh, dioxide, uh, which indicates a, a number of things which are pretty well known. For example, if you have uh, solid uh, carbon dioxide, which we call uh, dry ice, it will sublime directly to the gas phase at at uh, at uh, uh, room conditions uh, there. Uh, the critical point uh, occurs here at, uh, at 73 um, bars and uh, around 304 degrees uh, Kelvin. And it's, it's relatively uh, accessible in laboratory experiments without having to have uh, pressures that are, they're still, you don't have to worry about them in terms of designing experiments, uh, but they're easily uh, accessible. And you can control easily in this region to, uh, to have a supercritical fluid where the gas and the liquid is no longer uh, distinguished there. Uh, now, in fact, that diagram is, is, is much more uh, complicated than that because you have pressure, volume, and, and temperature. So it's, it's three dimensions. Uh, and uh, you can take uh, various uh, cuts uh, in this uh, diagram. Uh, the one that is um, uh, <coughs> uh, most often looked at in uh, textbooks on, on statistical mechanics and, and thermodynamics is uh, one where we look at the uh, pressure uh, against the a specific uh, volume, so the liters uh, per mole of the uh, of the substance uh, there, uh, and this is the is a carbon di dioxide PV uh, diagram taken right out of Macquarie and Simon's uh, Physical Chemistry and Molecular Approach, which is the text we use here at, uh, at Caltech. I'm not advertising it, but um, uh, they're, they're <laughs> the students don't like the book. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the things to, to notice on here is that above the uh, critical uh, point. Uh, you no longer have uh, coexisting uh, phases uh, that uh, include both vapor and liquid, which you have at, uh, at, lower, at uh, lower temperatures uh, there. Uh, and I'm, I like to do uh, experiments. And um, <coughs> Yeah, doesn't want to talk to me. Okay, uh, so 
if, if you're way away from, from the, um, from the uh, critical uh, point <clears throat> with a, a liquid and it's uh, vapor and you heat it up, the liquid will simply transfer into vapor where you have only vapor. If you're very close to the critical, critical point though, what you'll see actually is this phase boundary uh, will disappear uh, and you'll have a, 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 a fluid here, the so-called supercritical uh, phase. Uh, and, and a lot of people actually regard this <coughs> Um, as, as, a, as a state of, of matter that is very different uh, from a liquid or, or, a, uh, or a gas there. Now, um, I was able to uh, take part of a, of a video off of uh, YouTube where you can actually see in this uh, chamber, homemade chamber, you know, a guy does this in his basement. Uh, this is on the physical science um, uh, web. Uh, site, or I guess they, they, uh, they're, they're combined uh, <coughs> videos there. So here, th this, is, this is generated by taking a block of dry ice uh, and uh, clamping it uh, uh, with an aluminum ring uh, in between two uh, plexiglass um, uh <coughs> windows, one on each side sealed uh, with, uh, with a, an O-ring. And uh, not having done the calculation as to what the pressure would be when the dry ice actually uh, melted, uh, the first experiments were done using a video camera and the guy off in another room monitoring what happened in there. But uh, based on that, he, gets, uh, he actually gets uh, pretty, uh, pretty gutsy. Okay, so now it's warming up. And you're going to see this dividing line disappear. I love this. You know, this is very visual, all right? So the entire space now is filled with supercritical fluid. You no longer have the separate liquid and, and uh, vapor uh, phases there. Uh, this is a little slower. Uh, I've, I'm not going to go through all the narration because this goes on for, for 15 uh, minutes, and I would, I would really incur uh, Michelle's uh, wrath. But you can see the, the design here. It's just a... Uh, aluminum ring with two rings uh, uh, grew, uh, cut in it, and then he just took a <coughs> pressure gauge. Uh, it records about a thousand uh, psi with the piece of dry ice that he uh, is clamped in there. Uh, <coughs> to uh, cause the phase transition, he simply takes some heating tape, uh, wraps it around, uh, and he's going to insert then a, a thermocouple, and you'll be able to see the uh, temperature here. Now it'll start off at uh, more or less ambient uh, temperature, and you'll see right around 30, 32 degrees. Uh, it goes through the, uh, the phase uh, transition there. I cringe when I see this. This guy's not even wearing safety glasses. <laughs> so it's not good from that uh, point, of, point of view there. Now, now why, why is this really important to, to visualize? Because <clears throat> what you realize is, is when is when, a, uh, when liquid uh, carbon dioxide undergoes the phase transition to, to superfluid, it fills the entire volume. Now, what, what does that mean with respect to chemistry that might occur? If it were in contact, for example, say the vapor phase with, with mica, and there are people that think that, you know, you can have some chemistry between the sheets, right? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it, it helps to have catalysis from the interactions with the mica when you have molecules in there, RNA or other uh, molecules. Uh, but the, the, the sheets will be permeated by the superfluid um, uh, carbon dioxide. The same with other, other minerals or porous uh, substances. Of course, this is the way you extract uh, caffeine from green coffee beans. Uh, the superfluid penetrates uh, into the uh, coffee bean, dissolves the, uh, the caffeine, and the caffeine then is extracted with the, into, the, into the CO2 fluid phase and can be separated when... Uh, when you let the uh, CO2 uh, evaporate uh, there. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll leave that now. And uh, this just is, uh, in case the movie didn't work, it allowed me to, to show some uh, pictures there. <coughs> uh, and as far as critical points are concerned, um, carbon dioxide is, is not uh, unique here at uh, 31.3 degrees centigrade and a pressure of around 73 uh, atmospheres. In fact, it's very similar uh, to, to ethane, slightly lower uh, pressure. So one could have uh, supercritical uh, ethane uh, as well. There. So if it were buried on, on Titan and under geological conditions that raise the uh, pressure up at the right temperature, 
uh, one could have uh, superfluid uh, ethane uh, available to dissolve things and perhaps participate in, uh, in chemistry. Yeah. It's pretty easy to, I, I was just, easy is not a good word <coughs> there. Uh, but uh, there, there are a wealth of data uh, available, and we'll have a, a wiki posted for the, for the study where people can post papers for other uh, people to read. And that's, so I've got a selection of about 10 papers on uh, supercritical CO2, its properties and, and uses that uh, will be um, posted. Uh, but to measure uh, solubilities, the apparatus is very similar to what uh, Rob uh, described. Uh, and in fact, it's not too different from the components you'd actually find uh, in a uh, supercritical CO2 uh, chromatography uh, experiment. You have a cylinder of uh, carbon dioxide, which is the same as any cylinder, except that it has a, a tube that uh, goes down into the bottom uh, to be able to uh, take off the liquid as opposed to the gas at the top of the tank. Uh, that comes into a syringe pump, uh, which can be used to uh, compress it uh, to pressures that uh, cause it to become uh, supercritical. You have a, a, a reaction chamber here that can withstand the, uh, the pressures. The temperatures aren't extreme. It's on a, a temperature uh, controller uh, so that you can uh, also control uh, the temperature. So you simply put your, your, your uh, materials uh, in there and, uh, <coughs> and look at the, the amount that uh, is, uh, is dissolved. Uh, you can also carry out reactions in a chamber by this, and the method of analysis is usually uh, to uh, expand uh, the, uh, the gases, uh, mix with uh, uh, a fluid uh, phase, uh, and do HPLC, or to directly do, uh, you can do uh, supercritical fluid uh, chromatography uh, as well. On that. But it's usually uh, HPLC that's used to analyze the products that are dissolved there, <coughs> or the reaction products uh, that are uh, formed. So there are lots of these experiments there. Uh, but from, from examining a wide uh, range of molecular uh, species, what is generally concluded uh, is that carbon dioxide actually uh, exhibits properties that are not unlike uh, hydrocarbon uh, solvents, such as uh, toluene, in terms of what it will uh, dissolve. Uh, <coughs> the uh, basic molecules here, like, like parole, uh, CO2 does provide uh, more hydrogen bonding basicity than, than do uh, hydrogen, uh, so hydrocarbon solvents. Uh, so with the oxygen, it's, it's an it's a H atom, a hydrogen atom uh, acceptor in terms of, of uh, hydrogen uh, bonding, uh, but not nearly as good as a, as a, uh, as a water molecule. Uh, <clears throat> but it has other uh, properties in terms of its compressibility and the supercritical state, very low surface tension and viscosity, has low polarizability, although uh, it's, it's moderate, you know, quite a bit higher than nitrogen. Uh, but it's very easy to evaporate and to get your, your solute back there. Uh, and for this reason, it's been used in what is now known as uh, green chemistry, where you carry out processes in, in supercritical CO2, and it's very easy to evaporate it and to, these days, recapture it <laughs> uh, for recompression and, and, uh, and reuse. So the example there is a lot of industrial processes uh, use this, isolating uh, products from, from uh, uh, reactions as well as uh, extracting caffeine from uh, coffee beans. There. Um, if you actually look at, at a lot of uh, studies, usually of individual molecules that people are trying to dissolve in supercritical CO2, uh, what you find really is it looks like you can dissolve almost anything. Proteins, what you have to do is pay attention to why they don't dissolve and then to, to, to use countermeasures. All right? So you add a little bit of water. All right, not a lot. It's still supercritical, but it's, it's got a little co-dissolved uh, water in it. And that really helps, say, with, a, with an enzyme that wants to have certain portions uh, solvated. Uh, you can add uh, counter ions. Uh, <clears throat> the proteins, proteins really are not very soluble. Uh, nature designs them. Uh, so on the outside, you have uh, uh, the, uh, the, the acidic and basic uh, residues. So it would typically include um, uh, lysine, um, arginine, which are cationic and protonated at uh, physiological uh, pHs. Uh, and then as a counter ion, uh, usually uh, in conjunction with, the, uh, with those two uh, amino acids, you have uh, aspartic acid and glutamic acid forming ion pairs at the surface, which then solvate uh, very well and add to the solubility of the uh, protein. 
but they really are just barely wanting to be in water. If, if you have uh, proteins that can access an air-water interface, almost all of them will, will migrate to the air-water interface uh, and then rearrange to, to expose a more hydrophobic uh, face at the, uh, towards the air. Uh, and it has lower free energy at the interface than it does in, in, the, in the bulk there. Uh, <clears throat> but by adding uh, counter ions there, as well as just a few water molecules, you can solubilize uh, many enzymes, and they retain their structure and their activity there. If you really get desperate, you can just use an inverse micelle. Right? <clears throat> so if hydrocarbons like hydrocarbons and CO2 is acting like a hydrocarbon uh, solvent, uh, simply uh, use, uh, make an inverse uh, micelle with the hydrocarbon portion on the outside, uh, water in your, your solvated molecule on, on the inside uh, there. Now there are some other things which are quite interesting and people probably could have paid uh, more attention to over the years because they've seen things that I think are explained by these differences but haven't invoked these differences to, for, for that uh, explanation there. Uh, densities, uh, uh, gas density grams per milliliter, uh, ten, well, it's, it's variable, of course, but say 10 to, 10 to the minus 3 for an evaporated uh, liquid. Uh, <coughs> supercritical uh, fluid, uh, very close uh, to, the, uh, to the liquid. You know, so if, uh, we have one gram per milliliter, like water, uh, supercritical fluids here could be up as high as 0.9 uh, uh, grams per milliliter. So the density is actually like water, which is why it's such a wonderful uh, solvent there. Uh, the viscosity uh, of the supercritical fluid, though, uh, two orders of magnitude less than, than, the, um, than the solid, and in fact comparable to the gas there. So it's like a liquid gas there. But diffusivity, you can actually move with a fairly high velocity if things are diffusing through a supercritical solvent. It just gets out of the way like a gas molecule uh, would. So diffusion constants here are usually in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus 3 uh, centimeters squared um, per second. Uh, which can be as much as, as uh, two to three orders of magnitude faster than you have uh, in a liquid. Now, if an enzyme uh, is, is, is a good enzyme, then the rates are, are diffusion limited. And you do the reaction in supercritical CO2, it's 100 times faster, right? Because diffusion's 100 times uh, faster. So there's some interesting properties of the supercritical CO2 that you simply uh, don't get in either liquid CO2 are an aqueous uh, environment. And these are things to think about in terms of uh, chemical uh, reactivity. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you can immobilize um, enzymes. Uh, this is a process which is uh, being uh, commercialized uh, right now uh, <clears throat> to um, use uh, lipase uh, here to catalyze the kinetic resolution of, uh, of uh, alcohols there. So again, the apparatus is not too different from the one I've already uh, showed you. Uh, except now instead of a, 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 a cell to measure solubilities, uh, we have an immobilized enzyme which can be placed uh, in the cell, uh, and then you can <coughs> actually uh, pump the uh, substrate in. Usually it's a flow system uh, that you can run uh, continuously here uh, with a back pressure regulated, keeping the fluid supercritical, uh, but extracting the, um, extracting the product and recovering the, the CO2 there. Uh, and, uh, Basically, the nanomeric uh, <coughs> excess is here greater than, than 1,000. There. So if you have a racemic uh, mixture, uh, <coughs> you can basically isolate the R isomer, uh, and uh, the S isomer doesn't react with the, um, with the lipase because it doesn't uh, bind. And uh, these, these now have commercial names, these bound uh, um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, enzymes there. The, the, Candida Antarctica lipase B, known as Novozyme uh, 435. There. Um, so these are now uh, commercial uh, processes there. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, chemical evolution, we're interested not only in chemical processes, but also in, in photochemical um, processes. Uh, by using uh, an immobilized uh, uh, photosensitizer, uh, uh, here, which is usually a, a ruthenium uh, complex, uh, and using illumination, this is energy friendly again, uh, LEDs, uh, uh, UV LEDs, uh, one can carry out uh, very fast uh, reactions uh, for photochemical oxidation involving the formation and, and reaction of uh, singlet uh, oxygen. Uh, so these are some of the processes uh, where the, the yields are uh, essentially uh, quantitative uh, there. 
uh, published a, a couple of years uh, ago. Uh, <coughs> Um, and this is the apparatus, pretty simple, uh, set up with the UV LEDs to do the uh, photolysis uh, experiments there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, amino acids have been uh, synthesized, um, and uh, also uh, peptides have, have been uh, prepared in supercritical carbon dioxide uh, water uh, system there. I don't have the time to, to go through all of the chemistry, but again, these papers will be uh, available. Uh, essentially, this is starting with hydroxylamine uh, hydrochloride uh, and then either pyruvic acid or glyoxalic acid, imagined to be prebiotic molecules, but this may be stretching things a, a little bit, which are reacted uh, to form uh, an oxime. Uh, and then that particular uh, oxime under <coughs> reduction conditions in uh, supercritical uh, CO2 has been shown to directly form uh, alanine uh, as well as um, um, polymers of the, uh, of the alanine in that. So peptide bond formation by dehydration is occurring in this medium uh, as well. So there's some interesting, I would call these preliminary uh, results uh, that uh, indicate that uh, one can do uh, some interesting uh, uh, experiments making uh, amino acids and their, and their polymers. Uh, but <clears throat> is it likely to be important in the origin of an RNA uh, world? Uh, it does form an organics-friendly environment to enrich and, and fractionate uh, bioorganic molecules on a, on a planetary scale. And Steve Benner uh, is a little optimistic about this. He's done some preliminary experiments, I don't believe these are, are published, in, in which, he, which he's shown that uh, certain nucleobases are, are actually uh, quite uh, soluble into supercritical uh, CO2. So he envisions actually an, an RNA uh, synthesis, not all steps of which have been demonstrated, uh, which involves uh, <coughs> uh, passing back and forth between a water phase and a supercritical phase. So again, uh, the interaction of, of molecules the, with, the, with the different uh, environments that you have in, in these phases uh, gives you advantages uh, in terms of being able to do chemistry in one phase that's not easy to accomplish or would lead to an unstable product in the other phase. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm trying to stay under my red lights, uh, red lights on there. I think I only had 22, so Rob's got me beat there. Uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> adios to, uh, uh, to Waterworld. I think one reason I, I showed this was Kevin Costner used to be uh, a neighbor of, of mine, uh, and uh, now his wife is a neighbor <laughs> of mine there in, in uh, and La Cunata there. <clears throat> and uh, I'll thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you.